We're here today for a Veterans History Project interview with Mr. Robert Emery. He was in the U.S. Army during World War II, and he served over in Europe. And um, I guess what I'll do is start by asking him, uh, you know, how did you get involved in the military, Mr. Emery? Well, first of all, I, I had a hernia, so I was not qualified for service, and I had surgery to repair that. And then I started at the University of Illinois to recover. And uh, there I joined the Enlisted Reserve Corps where they could call me up when they wanted to. And so I had a year and a half at the University of Illinois. My, excuse me, that was a semester and a half. And they called me up in the, the spring and they sent me for basic training in the medics at Camp Robinson, Arkansas. And then they took me out of that and they sent me back to college in an Army Specialized Training Program called the ASTP. And I was sent to Texas A&M to study engineering. So you were initially sent to go in to be a medic, but then you were, they, they, took, they brought you back out and sent you to engineering school. That's right. What made, they, you, they, what made them decide to have you go in as a medic? Were you interested in that, or did they just deem that that was something they thought you'd be on, good at? On the contrary, I, I asked for anything but the medics or the infantry. <laughs> and they put you right in with... <laughs> and you know, you know the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yes, and so... Uh, but that was... Uh, they put... Uh, what was it? I believe, you know... 150,000 150, uh, young men in this. They had to have a, a IQ of 122 or above. They had to have 115 to get into aerial cadet training. You had to have 110 to get into officer candidate school. Uh, you had to be under 22 years old and of good moral character. And so I was, I was, uh, went through a star center down at Louisiana State University where they decided where they would put me into to, uh, the study of law, uh, history, uh, medicine, or engineering. And they put me back in engineering at Texas a and what kind of engineering were, were you studying? Anything Mechanical in? engineering. Mechanical engineering. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, so then they went on for some months until they, they needed uh, more manpower in Europe. They lost a lot of men crossing France. And they took they put 50,000, I believe, of those set aside. I had the figure somewhere, but you know, I guess they took 30,000 set aside. They offered to send me to Stanford Medical School, the best medical school in the country. And I declined. And they, two weeks later, they offered to send me to Stanford again, and I declined. So they sent me to Camp House, Texas, and put me in the 103rd Infantry Division in a medical collecting company. And they didn't ask you if they could send you there, did they? <laughs> there was, wasn't any asking from there on. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, it was, uh, but you know, I had a great adventure. So uh, the. Uh, from, I was fortunate actually because uh, some of these uh, 120,000 ASTPers 
had no training before they were sent into combat. And, uh, but I had, oh, I had about six weeks of conditioning and, and some uh, training. And uh, I guess the best thing, the best training I had, well, I had a, a first sergeant who had an IQ of 59. And the only lecture he ever gave us was about the German 88 millimeter gun. He said it fires a, a clip with three shells and they land in a triangular pattern. After that, they had to reload. Mm -hmm. Well, that was very useful to me. When we advanced, started advance on the 15th of March, 1944, because we'd gone up to evacuate a, a man that was lying out in the open uh, who had lost his leg from above the knee. We tightened the tourniquet, we untightened the tourniquet, tourniquet to restore circulation, we tightened it, put him on the litter and started to carry him out of that valley when I heard a shell coming in. And I said, put him down in that shell, lay down around him. The first shell came in, it was right on our range. And it landed to our right. And I thought he didn't tell us what the pattern was. The next shell landed to hit us. And the first shell had been close. It raised us that right off the ground from the blast and threw us back down to debris all over us but anyway. And so then the third shell came on. And that, actually it ended up further off to our right. But in our exact range again. The Germans had a habit of surveying uh, spots, funnel spots as they retreated. And so that's how they had our exact range. And so that then I knew that they had to reload and I said, pick them up, let's go. And you lose all your adrenaline and you're running on your knees. You feel like you're running on your knees, but we got defilade. That means something between you and them. They couldn't see us. They fired three more shots and missed us, mm -hmm. and Jeep came along and took us back to the advanced uh, uh, reg uh, well, regimental aid station. And well, anyway, that was the morning's activity, and the afternoon while well, we walked, and we walked, and we came to this little town, and I thought, boy, I'm finally going to get a drink of water and a chance to rest. But they were, uh, anybody who was still ambulatory able to walk, they're picking up and loading in, in trucks and carrying further past the town. Mm -hmm. They they stopped the trucks by some brush and told us to dismount. And so we got out and they were waving us through the brush in two separate lines. And actually we were being led through goat trails that had been revealed to General McAuliffe. And, well, he wasn't a general at that time, but he became the general. Mm -hmm. He was a colonel. So, so you were near Bastogne at this point? Uh, mm, not exactly, but uh, yeah, we were, we were still, uh, I'm trying to think of just about how far we went. We noticed that we walked a long time, walked all day, and then they loaded us. Now, now I wouldn't say we are toward, toward Bastogne at that time. We were, but we, uh, uh,
anyway, that uh, started up these goat trails, and of course they were pretty narrow, but we were in two lines, one on each side of the goat trail. And I guess it was probably about five o'clock in the afternoon, I looked off to my right and I saw a firefight. And you could see it from the tracer bullets and the shells going back and forth. And I realized that we were behind the German lines. Mm. And that night we we spent at a shelled out oh, mountain house. I slept in a pile of bricks for defilade. Mm -hmm. The next morning uh, we joined others on a blacktop road leading toward Germany. We're still in France. And the uh, we would advance, we'd walk for 50 minutes and then rest for 10 minutes. At each rest stop, the the, company, the head company would stay in place and the others would advance. That spreads the risk. And we advanced that way until we got to the border of Germany. Mm -hmm. And our objective was Bobenthal, which was the key uh, <laughs> point in the Siegfried line. And our Colonel Yule was sitting on the border marker. It was a stand, triangular sandstone border marker. And he was waving us ahead and said, go get them boys, go get them. And our guys were mumbling something that was pretty awful. Mm -hmm. But we went up that corduroy road through the mountains. I was carrying a heavy, my end of a heavy uh, medical equipment box. And we stopped at the edge of Bobenthal. And I was among about 12 men at that edge there, looking down in the Bobenthal. And all was quiet down there. And they sent two scouts ahead to scout out and see if there was any opposition down there. And the, we were looking right down a road that ran, I presume, I'd say it was north through Bobenthal. There was a near road that cut off to the left, and then there was a T road that ran from the right past that road. Uh, to the left. And so we worked our way down there behind the scouts until we got to that T intersection and we turned left and started out of Bobenthal. We were on the, on the outskirts of Bobenthal when a jeep passed us and a gun fired right out of the side of the mountain. There was no defilade. We were all laying down on the concrete, faces almost on the concrete. I lifted the, the edge of my my helmet and, and peeked out, and I was looking right at that gun that the Germans had set back in the rock of that mountain. And all that showed was the door and the gun sticking out of it. How far there. away were you from it? Oh. I'd say about three blocks. Wow. And so uh, then they, we had a walkie-talkie and they called us back into town, back into Bobenthal. And uh, we sent, spent the night on that first road to the left that I had mentioned earlier. And the artillery had come in there and I was laying on a hardwood floor and bouncing every time they fired one of those artillery pieces in the backyard. Hmm. They had about two or three of them back there. They were shelling the Germans. And the, uh, anyway, we took Bobenthal 
and uh, our division commander uh, got tired of that gun stopping our view. We were going down through a ravine to go around it. We'd be out of sight. But uh, uh, McAuliffe, I'll, I'll call him General McAuliffe because he's the general in my eye. And he had his driver drive his Jeep right up to that gun with his uh, general's flag flying. And he pounded on that steel door with his pistol. <laughs> and told them to come out. Really? And these three Germans came out with their, their hands in their heads, a typical sign of German surrender, and their, what, wool skull caps on. And he took them. So then we could get up into the mountains easier, and we were looking for German pillboxes in the Siegfried line. And uh, I remember one of these well, one of these occasions that we're, we're I would say halfway up the mountain when the dive bomber came over and we all hit the dirt and it's quite a terrifying experience because it feels like that's right on you it ain't ranked right for you but they peeled off and the bomb hit on the other side of the mountain. Hmm. <laughs> But we then we went on to a little mountain stream where uh, everybody, for the most part, repented, replenished their canteens with fresh water. And then we had about a block's run across an open metal field up there. It was unusual, but it was it was a, a field where they raised hay, and it was about a block wide and about two blocks long. And I was carrying a litter, folded up litter. And there was a sniper up in, somewhere up in the trees and he fired at every one of us as we crossed that one block of open spot. And he didn't hit a one of us. Uh, maybe it was a poor shot. <laughs> we dug in when it, we got to the other side and there was another medic with us where I was traveling with a heavy weapons company. I could believe that was Company G of the 100, what, what, uh, 181st, I guess, regiment. Uh, anyway, and we dug a very narrow foxhole and put the litter uh, over most of it and piled the the dirt from digging a hole over the top. Again, we get some protection from mm -hmm. uh, shell fragments. And we go in through, we went in through the end, through the litter handles at the end. And that's the way we spent the night. In the morning when the Germans threw some uh, mortar shells into the trees overhead because uh, they would burst there and they to inflict injury if people weren't well protected. No one was injured. And the captain sent a staff sergeant and two riflemen out through the brush. You couldn't see where, where they were going. Uh, they, you know, they just disappeared immediately. And they were gone, I'd say, about 20 seconds when this familiar uh, German 88 millimeter gun fired the first shell. And I knew they had two more shells left in there. I looked over at the captain and he jerked his thumb. It tipped that, that litter over and took the front end of it and ran into that brush. I knew I was going to die. Well, these two guys, or three guys, came back 
and the staff sergeant had been impacted by that from the shock of the thing. And, and so we helped him back and we got back to our company area and we returned to Bobbinsall, a day's work. But uh, so anyway, later on, and again in Bobenthal, the Germans must have gotten word that uh, McAuliffe was running control duty on the traffic at that T intersection. He didn't want them to argue about who went next. It could cause a traffic jam, and that would give the Germans a chance to uh, inflict heavy casualties. Uh, with artillery. Mm -hmm. So he'd stand over there and guide that traffic. Well, the Germans threw a big shell over the mountain. They, they missed McAuliffe. I'm sure he was the intended target. But they hit the, the rear of our regimental aid station. And this killed two medics in the kitchen. It knocked me down into the, to the basement where I had a slight wound in my left elbow, and that qualified me for a Purple Heart. But we moved across the street because that building was untenable, and there I was directly across the street from General McAuliffe. And I realized that this is the next morning after they tried to get him. He's back, same spot, directing traffic. <laughs> uh, by this time, you know, realize that McAuliffe is my general. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, uh, the, we went uh, past that the, and went into deeper into Germany. And uh, so anyway, the 411th Infantry Regiment uh, had a lot to do with uh, breaking into Germany and closing the gap that encircled, I think it was 80,000 German troops uh, in the Ruhr, which was their heavy factory, heavy industrial area for armaments. But, uh, uh, that about it? That's, well, that's about it. That's, that's my, my story that, uh, that I wanted to tell about General McAuliffe. Mm -hmm. I'm no hero. He's the hero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just we, we, we had We had a saying. There aren't very many heroes, you see, that uh, because most heroes are, heroes are dead. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So when you came across the Atlantic yeah. over to Europe, did you go, you said you went through the Straits of Gibraltar? Yes. And you landed at the port of Marseille? Marseille, yes. Yeah. And you went straight up from there? Well, the first we, we had a little pup tent encampment, you see, so for whatever reason, for us to further prepare the, I guess, the logistics and all that. And mm -hmm. then uh, the whole division, 103rd Infantry Division, went up through the Rhone Valley. There's a road, there was a two-lane paved highway. Mm -hmm. The uh, Germans had uh, tried to pull out, and they had bombed the bridge ahead of them, and they had destroyed a, a lot of uh, German armament uh, vehicles. And uh, but they had patched the bridge, and we got over the bridge, and we on, went on into uh, further up in France, and there we the division fought through the Vosges Mountains of France in the winter, and that's the first time in history that had ever been done. Mm -hmm. And we came out at Saint D A D I E, and. Uh, that was a place where they had these uh, like 20 foot deep entrenchments in World War II. Some of them were still showing at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, 
You mean from World War One? For World War One, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What was it? Um, just, I'm sure you probably remember your first experience as a medic in under fire. What was what was that like? Well, I was uh, I was sent for a little combat training. I was one of the eight men taken from the uh, 103rd Infantry Division and, and uh, matched with eight men uh, taken from the experienced and uh, war-toughened 3rd Infantry Division. And so that made it a total of, let's see, 16 of us mm -hmm. that were sent up to uh, evacuate uh, four American wounded who were not ambulatory, meaning they couldn't walk. It takes four men to, to a litter. And we walked from the regimental aid station, which was cut back in the side of a mountain, really, with a tarp over the opening. But from that area, we went through a, a logging trail, and we walked for miles until it, we passed uh, American tanks that were dug in. That means that they had bulldozed a hole for them, and they'd back into them. So just the gun was showing over the soil ahead of them. Mm -hmm. Our tanks didn't have the armament or the power that the German tanks had, and so this was a strategy. We passed those tanks and walked on for, oh, I guess at least another mile. We came to an opening at the edge of the forest, and there we stopped, and the, and the men from the 3rd Infantry Division pointed out the location. Our target was across this little valley. It was a shelled out farmhouse that still had the concrete uh, covered to the basement intact. And that was where the wounded men were. Mm -hmm. There was a German tank off to the right that dominated the whole thing that would have us in clear view as we approached this. And we were told to run one at a time toward our target, and that's the, the wounded, and zig and zag, so that they wouldn't have your exact range from that, that tank. Well, I was the last one to leave, it so happened, when I heard somebody behind me shout, hey, and I turned around, and there was a, an officer standing at, at the kind of uphill from me, and about a block away. And he was waving to me, hey. But he had a problem because he was a German officer, and he was wearing gray uniform. And that sent me on my way, because I zigged and zagged and got down there and joined these other guys, and I told, told on that German officer. Well, these guys from the 3rd Division didn't seem too upset about that, but they passed out these huge solid chocolate bars for energy, and we each ate one of those, and then we loaded up with four men to a litter mm -hmm. and started carrying those guys out. And we were zigging and zagging with that. And that time that tank fired at us, but they didn't get us. We got to the top of the hill and turned, and we got definitely we got some hill between the, them and the gunner. They could see us, they continued to fire, but didn't get us. And so it was a long, tired carry back to the regimental aid station at night. Four guys 
carrying a four, one four guys one carrying man. one man. Yeah, and it might sound easy, but it isn't. And you said you had to go for miles. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And so when we got back there, we found that our our lieutenant had had come up, and he did get there in front of the our own. Uh, 103rd Infantry Division, but they, they have, our first ones in the 103rd Infantry Division uh, arrived just at, at sunrise. And, and anyway, with that, well, they, they took us back to our regular locations. But, uh, and that was your first experience as a combat medic going in under fire? Yeah. My goodness. That was on, that was on, uh, the 11th of November, 1944, yeah. Armistice Day. My goodness. So you had to probably be thinking, my gosh, if this is my first time in, how am I going to survive all this? Yeah, well, yeah, I was under artillery fire many times. I was under sniper fire once, which I mentioned. I found myself in the middle of a minefield once and learned to read the divots. Uh, but the worst thing to me is when you couldn't see uh, what your, what your like, mines, or uh, you couldn't see through debris, you know, trash, low brush, or trees. Uh, so that was the most most impacting to me, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, no, uh, yeah. Of course, about that. I uh, see that one third of these ASTP boys that were sent over there were killed or injured. My goodness. I was luckier than, than half of them because they had no combat training. They were just sent in as individual replacements. They didn't know anybody. It was a terrible thing to do. I interviewed a fellow a few years ago who was in the ASTP program, and um, I was wondering if you had the same sort of experience. They, they, they came to realize at a certain point that they needed these guys more than they, in, in combat than they needed them in training. So they disbanded the STP program and basically sent you guys into combat. Was that kind of what happened with you? Because you mentioned how a lot of these guys that were in the ASTP were just sent over as replacements at some point. Yes, exactly. Well, see, that uh, that wasn't... The unfortunate ones were just sent over as individual replacements and they were put in what they called repo. repo uh, depots, and uh, and they didn't know anybody. They didn't know the guy next to them, and and uh, anyway, they uh, then they were signed, uh, sent up, uh, maybe four at a time to to fill in as replacements to people lost, mm -hmm. and nobody wanted anything to do with them because. Uh, uh, they tend to draw fire. They'd want to stand up to look to see where the Germans were and stuff, stuff like that. And uh, that's an unhealthy experience. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so you see, I was fortunate in having some training and and knowing some of the people around me. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but then there's then there's the attrition effect that I. Uh, I think I learned sort of a unique thing, though, with me, and that I could tell when a man was on the point of going crazy. And some of them I keep could keep on the safe side of the bridge, but uh, the. Uh, how 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 could you? You said you could tell. What, what, what did you see? 
Well, you see certain emotion in them, you see, and uh, normal, uh, then normal action and fear. Uh, like I guess I was sensing fear. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but uh, you see, I, I'm not afraid to die. I lost that when I walked into that gun up in the mountain above uh, Bob and Thaw. Mm -hmm. I died there. They can't kill you but once. Mm -hmm. Sounds kind of strange. But okay. But, uh, but I, I still retain some ability along that. And if, if I, it's on my goal. If I, I know somebody's stressed out, I offer to to sit with them, watch with them, okay. The, uh, and then of course there's another thing that you notice and you look around and you see how many of the guys you started out with are gone. And they're gone because of uh, wounds or or combat stress, called combat fatigue. They call it battle rattle, but it's real now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, so I know. Again, I feel I'm lucky. I I was able to endure that, and and uh, and I feel like I came out of it. Oh, I'm. I'm not. Uh, I'm not disgruntled about it. I, it uh, the uh, why did I walk into into that gun that I couldn't see? Because I didn't want to dishonor my family. I didn't want to dis dishonor my country. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so. Anyway, they, uh, we won the war with Germany, and then they were going to to uh, send us against, well, they transferred uh, me from the 103rd Infantry Division to the 45th Division, uh, which was going to go against Japan. And so they, we went out of Germany and, and 40, 40 and 8 boxcars, that means 40 men or eight horses that the Germans had used uh, to transport all their victims to the uh, extermination camps. The reason I know that is that there was a about a four inch diameter hole dug at each end of the boxcar. One was his and one was hers. Mm. So I didn't have it so rough, but boy, those people didn't. That was a terrible thing to do. And that's how they transported you? Well, yeah, but you see that they, these were cleaned up as best they could, but it was one of those boxcars that I was traveling in out of Germany and back into France on my way back uh, to England and then back to the United States where we were to, to uh, get a month's furlough be re-equipped and sent against Japan. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew that my luck had run out. But then, when I was at uh, the big camp near Reims, France, staging camp, they dropped the bombs, on the big bombs, the atom bombs on Japan, and they surrendered, and I didn't have to go. Uh, that, that, uh, we would have lost a, a million men in that, mm -hmm. and, the, and the Japanese would have lost four million people in that if we'd had to take Japan. Anyway, mm -hmm. so uh, well. 
Well, I guess that's most of my story. I don't know unless you had any other questions. So the uh, dropping of the atom bombs, no doubt, you feel saved your life. Absolutely. I know. I hear that from a lot of veterans, actually. <laughs> you yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, When I was a, a cruise many years later, there's a man at our table who was on the crew that dropped one of those bombs. Really? I thanked him. Hmm. Hmm. Did he say that he got that lot? Did he did he mention that he probably got thanked a lot? No. Hmm. No. But uh, uh, so imagine the risk that he was at. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about you know how you became a medic. You know you mentioned that you that was you specifically said you did not want to be a medic or an infantryman. Yet they saw fit for some reason to make you a medic. Were you a, a conscientious objector or anything? Was there anything that that they said, well, you know, let's make Well, they gave, you, they gave you some tests at, in the induction center, and uh, uh, they probably pick up some things like that on, mm -hmm. on that, you see. And, and note, that, note that I am a medic, mm -hmm. that I have a concern for other people. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons I wanted to be an engineer, which would take the heavy burden off the factory workers. They were, they were herniated. They were uh, had other physical ailments from from their hard work, mm -hmm. their lifting. And and the risk involved, and I wanted to make it safer for them. That was my goal: was to be, build better. I've always wanted to build since I was preschool. I mean, at, uh, mm -hmm. before I went to grade school, I wanted to build. And so many, so they see, I got. So they pick up on this. They 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 give you some more tests when you you get in and. And so, uh, yeah, and of course, again, you see, we had to pass a, a, an evaluation examination uh, to be selected to go to Stanford University. And you'll note that I passed that. Mm -hmm. And so, see, I have, I have some medical aptitude, but I hadn't taken uh, physics or chemistry. and. I hadn't taken Latin, I took French, uh, and so I didn't feel I was especially well qualified to start it. Mm -hmm. But but that wasn't all, it, uh, really. Basically, I wanted to be an engineer, mm -hmm. and later became one, anyway. So after the war, um, you went on to become an engineer then? Yeah, after after the war, uh, I uh, started. Well, I waited some months for my wife to complete her education at the University of Texas, and then we married in March 26 of 19 what would be 46. Mm -hmm. And I started back at the to, at the University of Illinois, where I, then I I uh, completed essentially three years' work in two years by going to summer school. Was that in Champaign, Illinois? Champaign, Urbana, Illinois. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so I got out as soon as I did I could because I needed to make a living, and and uh, I. Was, of course, the GI Bill was paying for my books 
and supplies, and they're giving us the, I guess, ninety dollars a month subsistence, but it was hard to live on, and, and uh, so those were pretty lean years. And, uh, and then when I got out, I first got a job with uh, General Motors in Northern Illinois. They were making diesel electric lo locomotives. Well, we couldn't find housing. My wife and I couldn't find housing that we could afford. And so I was in a rooming house some 50 miles from where she was. She was living with my parents in Harvard, Illinois. And Halliburton, who had interviewed me at the University of Illinois, called, and she took the job. That didn't please my mother, but I went south, mm -hmm. southwest, I'll say, but anyway, so I went, and so I started to work for Halliburton in the field as an engineer trainee. I had what I called six months experience three times, so 18 months later where they transferred me to uh, Duncan, Oklahoma, and, and put me in the equipment design uh, part of the engineering department. They'd offered me the choice to get into research, but I chose equipment design. I guess because of the, of the names of the surnames of the people who are running the different departments, but, uh, but anyway. Well, looking back on your experience in World War II, was there anything about that experience that you feel like changed you or shaped you from that point on as a person? Oh, you bet. See, the movies weren't real to me anymore. That. Uh, uh, the, uh, I, uh, I don't bluff worth a darn. I don't scare easily. Uh, I, uh, so, uh, so you feel like it probably had a, a profound emotional impact on you? Oh, nothing I couldn't handle. Well, but you mentioned that you don't bluff easily, you don't scare easily. Is it, did it make you just, uh, I guess, immune to the sorts of natural Fears and emotions that uh, the, per, the, the well, I'm not not a mean. It depends just how <laughs> serious they are, I guess. But you see that. Uh, uh, let me say, I don't bully easily, mm -hmm. and I've I've met a few really big, powerful bullies, <laughs> and they know who they are. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, What, you know, I guess um, for anyone who may watch this video, do you have any advice or anything that uh, anything you'd like to, to say in closing or, or, uh, or anything that, uh, that you'd like anyone to know or? Yes, I, I would advise them to be strong in their family relationships. and to be loyal to their employer, to cause, uh, to generate more income for your employer than you take from your employer. Good. Okay, well, um, I have no further questions. So uh, is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to talk about at this point? Any other experiences or anecdotes, stories? Yes, I think I have one. Okay. Uh, in one of our advances through Germany, 
they had uh, loaded us on, loaded us on, on trucks and taken us in through the forest until they started fire artillery. So to save the trucks, they put us off, and we we went in toward this roadblock. There, there, the typical German roadblock was to sink uh, four uh, tree trunks uh, on each side of the road with a slot between them, which they could then put cross trunks in if they chose it to make it a barrier. And then there would be a, a machine gun nest on one side and an 88 uh, millimeter gun on the other. And we kept disappointing them. Instead of going walking into that fire, we'd make a shortcut around and go on the other side of town. They'd get furious over that, you see, because <laughs> those, those Germans are a structured people. <laughs> I'm part German myself, I ought to know. But, <laughs> but, but anyway, so, I wanted, so we, we continued out of that, and we, we walked up into, oh, to the hills, I guess, above this, this town. And we came to this town from the backside. That was our whole plan, to surprise them, you see. It was a oh, small village, probably no more than 200 inhabitants. And we were about two blocks into that village before we were discovered. And then somebody started to fire. And I, I saw some movement over to my left. I looked over there. And a German soldier came out on the back porch of the house there in full view. He had his rifle in one hand and his steel helmet in the other hand. But he didn't have any pants on. Hmm. But he had his boots and he ran across that backyard and jumped over that wooden fence with no pants. And I was so abused, I'd been over laughing when a bullet whizzed right over my head. Oh my. <laughs> he saved my life. My goodness. <laughs> well, there's more to the tale, but that's enough. <laughs> I, I, that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's stop there. That's, that's a good way to end the interview. Well, I want to thank you personally for your service. I know you saw some, uh, some pretty extensive um, um, combat and everything, and I want to thank you for what you did for our country. Oh, I, I, I was only one of many. Well, um, thank you for letting me come in your home tonight and interview you. Thank you. Thank you.